major sponsors for Ableton On Air include Green Mountain Support Services of Vermont, Washington County Mental Health, Ale Israel. Food sponsors for Ableton On Air include Geffen Foods Israel, Osem Foods Israel. Major media sponsors for Ableton On Air include Parkchester Times, Muslim Community Report, www.thisisthebronx.info, Associated Press Media Editors, U.S. Press Corps, Domestic and International, Anchor FM, and Spotify. Welcome to this edition of Ableton On Air, the one and only program that focuses on our needs, concerns, and achievements of the differently abled. I am your host, Lauren Seiler. Arlene is here today. Before we before Arlene Seiler, before we introduce our guest, uh, we would like to say that this program today will be airing in January. We would like to thank our sponsors, Washington County Mental Health and Green Mountain Support Services and many others. Okay, Michelle, I'm gonna introduce you now. With COVID-19, and the onset of the way America's views of prejudice of the, as of late, the national, and with the national focus on the subject, civil rights me, and the Me Too movement and Black Lives Matter have grown stronger in fighting for equality and justice for our country. Some of our strengthened forces, forces have been with the tragic resurgence of white supremacy and neo-Nazi in the past four years, and the upswing of prejudice and racial injustice for police brutality and anti-Semitism on the rise. These didn't happen overnight. These prejudices and racial injustices have been the undercurrent of our country. Vermont author and historian Michelle Sherburn sits down with Ableton on air to discuss this as part of a series discussing the roots of prejudice found in our country's history and zooming in on Vermont's history. Welcome, Michelle Sherburn, to the show. Well, thank you, uh, Lawrence and Arlene. It's really good to uh, be able to talk with you. Okay. So let's begin. Uh, we understand that you've written several books on the abolition of slavery, the, uh, the abolition of slavery and the Underground Railroad, and written a book on St. Albans Raid and co-edited uh, co the Peachum Civil War book. Um, how does your historic research on these subjects a subject lend itself to today's racism, profiling, prejudice, uh, you know, different types of prejudices? Well, um, I'm, I am not a writer about today's politics and current state of affairs, but in researching um, the 1700s, 1800s, um, prejudice and racism roots um, kept surfacing. Uh, with the research I've done with slavery in our country and um, the Underground Railroad Network um, helping fugitive slaves up through New England and uh, especially Vermont and New Hampshire. Mm -hmm. So, um, well, I, I just started, when I started my research, um, I was focused on um, Vermonters helping runaway slaves to freedom back in the 1800s. And, uh, but I kept coming across uh, the misconception that Vermonters specifically were not all on the same page. They weren't all um, supportive of, uh, of the African Americans. They weren't supportive of slaves being free. And um, I found a lot of racism and prejudice embedded everywhere in the northern states and I think that's a big misconception that we've had. Mm -hmm. Misconception how so? I think that um, most people believe that all during, before the 1700s 
Civil War and during the Civil War that all northern states uh, were all against slavery and also wanted to have all of the um, African Americans be equal with them. Mm -hmm. And that's really not the way it was. Um, it was more that the northern sl states did not have, uh, did not allow slavery, and all the southern states did. Mm -hmm. So the misconceptions are were present that every you know everyone in the north uh, wanted free you know the, the African Americans free. Mm -hmm. um, in the recent years, what has been what has since changed in terms of prejudice? Uh, racial injustice and in our country, specifically in the last four years of the current administration? Well, like I said at the beginning, I'm, I, I'm not a current affairs author or writer, but I do work in the newspaper business. Um, I feel that um, over the past 10 years, our, our country was gaining. Um, it seemed to be... Uh, that people were becoming more tolerant and um, working on accepting people of all religions and all races and different cultures, and um, they were working on inclusion. And we saw more of this and less discrimination, especially with the uh, with uh, Barack Obama being elected president. I thought that was a really big step for our country. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think that everything went backwards in the last four years because the, the current administration uh, promoted prejudice, promoted racial injustice, uh, the profiling of the blacks by the police, um, profiling religions like Muslims and, and different races like Mexicans and Latinos. I think that we went backwards and it's been a do you think we went, uh, I'm going to ask you a kind of ad lib question here. Do you think we went backwards because uh, couple, about a year and a half ago, for example, in um, Pennsylvania, there was uh, a lot, some a synagogue, uh, uh, you know, some anti-Semitism with a synagogue shooting. And, you know, there's been burnings of churches and all kinds of different things. So do you think we went backwards more or we're continuing to, well, I know we're healing from stuff, from things like this, but do you think, uh, we'll, do you think we will continue to go backwards? Well, um, I, um, I, don't, I would say that there's always been an undercurrent of prejudice and racism, mm -hmm. that for a while things were toned down. Uh, but then all of a sudden, you saw white supremacists and neo-Nazis uh, yeah. up and right and, and stepping up and, and feeling like they could. Can, can I ask you a question, Michelle? Sure, go ahead. How has this, how has this thing changed since the George Floyd incident happened? Like, how is it's, it's like, how is it profile, like police profile blacks, you know? Since this happened, since this incident happened recently in, Minneapolis, and in the state of Minneapolis. Right, right. Well, I think that um, I think that uh, the public, more of the public, has become aware mm -hmm. of the brutality and the George Floyd um, tragedy. Really uh, opened up a lot of people's eyes, and and so I've been really pleased to see people going out and protesting. Um, you know, safely, not violently, uh, and standing up for um, civil rights. Yeah, yeah, civil rights, exactly, Arlene. Um, and and prejudice and racism because it's always been there. I just think that um, it. I think they were in the minority for the. Yeah. yeah. It's kind of a, a pun, but it's not. Uh, in, in terms of prejudice and the Civil War, I want to get a little bit to your books here. Uh, <laughs> you wrote you wrote a book uh, specifically on the abolition and the Underground Railroad in Vermont, um, and I'm going to show a, um, a a part of the cover here. Um, now, Thanks. how? Um, in terms of prejudice and people with disabilities and the Underground Railroad, how does this tie into um, 
you know, how bad was the prejudice during the Civil War um, leading up to today? Well, I think that um, what I learned through the researching of our country's slavery institution and the, the network of people helping slaves run away, which is the Underground Railroad, mm -hmm. um, I learned that um, the roots of the prejudice were because were, were way back when our country started. When they started, when the, the, they started bringing slaves to our country, they didn't view them as people. Mm -hmm. they, they, they viewed um, blacks from Africa as savages and animals. And mm -hmm. so that's a really... Sort of like, I apologize for interrupting, sort of like, sort of like what, they did, what they did for years, putting people with special needs in institutions, both mental and physical uh, challenges in institutions, viewing people with disabilities as animals. Uh, exactly, and, and there are a lot of correlations um, with prejudice that have to do with um, race and also, like you said, people with disabilities. A lot of it is the, the fear of the unknown, and um, I think that there was a difference, not that, the, not that there was any better treatment, but Native Americans were viewed a, a bit differently because Europeans came here and it was their country. They saw the Native Americans in a different way, where African Americans, all blacks, mm. who were brought to, they were involuntary um, immigrants. They were brought here against their will, and from the get-go, they were, like you said, considered animals. Mm -hmm. So we're not, this isn't that far back in history, if you really look at it. The 1800s, early 1900s, uh, you know, with Jim Crow laws and even... Can you explain, can you, uh, for those that don't know, our viewers, can you explain the short end, uh, the, maybe there's a short end of the Jim Crow laws, can you explain a little bit about that, please? Um, I will try, Lawrence. Um, I, I'm not an expert, so... I'm I sorry, just, I apologize, um, go ahead. I didn't mean to put you a, um, uh, put you on the spot there. Uh, I am sorry. <laughs> Getting to the Jews for getting to Jewish people for example, back in the forties, um, um, 
during, uh, they had in, in Poland and in uh, different parts uh, of, of Germany, they had uh, a, a horrible situation called, the, called uh, Kristallnacht. Now what Kristallnacht was, it's called the Night of Broken Glass. Uh, basically, if Jews had businesses, if Jewish people had businesses, um, butcher shop, uh, shoe sh um, shining shoes, clean, um, uh, you know, laundry, restaurant, mm -hmm. things like that. Whatever you had, um, they broke your windows and they took everything away from you. And, right. and um, there were some few people who, um, like Oscar Schindler who saved uh, about 13, uh, 1400 Jews, but, wow. but it, you know, um, some of it was jealousy, but then it was just, um, if, you know, if you didn't conform to what Adolf Hitler wanted, you were killed. And they right. even killed thousands more people with disabilities with the T4 project, uh, right. mental health, uh, physical challenge, if you were uh, one arm, one leg, if, if you, you know, spoke differently or whatever, had a speech impediment, you were killed. Right. And right. then at some point, ministers and even rabbis um, told, they had a meeting with Adolf Hitler during this thing, that, look, you have to stop killing children. You have to stop doing this. This, this, is, this is not God's will. And, but right. he didn't listen. So. No. But also, it's a time, uh, that was at a time frame when um, eugenic, the eugenics movement was across the, uh, the world. Yes, where yes. Mm -hmm. to eliminate the, the races that you thought were inferior and you were, just, and like Adolf Hitler, striving for a perfect race. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, you know, I... Uh, Grew up reading about Anne Frank. I read about Anne Frank and, and Corey Ten Boom and uh, people helping uh, hide Jews during the Holocaust. Um, a lot of that, a lot of that, tied in with um, when I studied the Underground Railroad networks, uh, where you were having people hide strangers to keep them safe and to move them on. So mm -hmm. I. I it, it is. It segued. It segued nicely into um, understanding what it was like to help strangers, which is what the focus of my uh, my books on on um, slavery and the Underground Railroad. Now, are. now, question: As far as the Underground Railroad, I'm going to show you other book here. The uh, the other book is entitled "Slavery and the Underground Railroad in New Hampshire." That's right. Um. So. Um, how was the tie-in between Vermont and New Hampshire during the Underground Railroad times? Well, basically, um, they, uh, the whole point of uh, slaves running away, most of them were, were shooting for Canada they, because Canada was, um, was a dominion of Great Britain and they didn't have slavery there. And you couldn't... You couldn't um, chase your slave into Canada and... Wait, wait, so Canada, Canada owned, or well, not owned, but Canada, what, what, uh, well, yeah, did, so they own Great Britain? Or I'm confused. They, no, no, they were, Great Britain um, owned Canada, and so they didn't have slavery up there, so mm -hmm. most slaves were shooting to get to Canada, and that was the promised land, that was the free land, and so... All, all roads led north, mm -hmm. and um, if you were um, moving runaway slaves through Connecticut, Massachusetts, you would head north, which takes you right up through Vermont and New Hampshire. And um, I took, I when we had spoke originally, Lawrence, I had said it took me 20-some years to write that first Vermont book on mm -hmm. the Underground Railroad. Mm -hmm. And the reason is, is because the misconceptions that... Uh, this far north was not an issue for runaway slaves uh, before the Civil War. That it, they were safe up here because no one would travel this far north to, to chase down property. Well, that's not true. 
and I found a lot of Vermont New Hampshireites who actually um, who actually helped runaway slaves, just like those in Philadelphia, New York, and Boston. So um, that's the tie-in: is that Vermont New Hampshire borders Canada, and mm-hmm. so many many were um, sent north to Canada through our states. Um, can you also explain, because you did a book uh, called The St. Albans Raid, uh, can you explain a little bit about that book and the correlation? Well, that kind of, uh, that kind of veers off onto a, 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 different, um, a different subject. Um, I got involved with uh, researching the Civil War um, because I, in the midst of my Underground Railroad uh, research, um, mm-hmm. I got into it because of family connection with a Civil War soldier. So um, I first worked two years with the Peachum Historical Association to create a book about the Civil War and the town of Peachum, Vermont, and their contributions to the Civil War. And that kind of got me studying the Civil War. And then um, the uh, 150th anniversary of the St. Albans Raid um, happened in 2014. And I pitched the idea to the publisher and said, hey, I think this would be a great book because it's a great story. Mm-hmm. So the story in a nutshell, I'll try, Lauren and Arlene, I'll try. Mm-hmm. Nutshell. Um, so 18, I'll take you back. 1864, um, the South is not doing well in the war. Um, all resources are being depleted and on both sides, and Jefferson Davis, the president of the Confederacy, sends spies and commissioners to Canada, and he says, you need to, you need to set up missions, undercover missions, that will undermine Abraham Lincoln's uh, forces. Mm-hmm. So one of those missions that was undercover was, let's do a raid from Canada south into, into the northern states so that they think they're being attacked by the North, the Canadians. So the first raid they thought they would try would be in St. Albans. So what they did was they commissioned 21 Confederate soldiers to, to go undercover into St. Albans in October 1864. Right. And they spent a week, you know, doing reconnaissance missions, checking things out, but also they were not in uniform and they were not uh, they were undercover and so they mixed and mixed with the townspeople and then they picked a day and they decided to um, take over the town mm-hmm. so they took hostages on um, on the park in, on Main Street they robbed three banks at the same time and they took off Wow! and mm-hmm. they basically took over the town saying we're taking it over for the Confederate States of America um and they thought that they could just get up, you know, you know, take the money and run and get into Canada. They'd be safe. But they didn't realize that Vermonters don't put up with that kind of stuff. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and um, about 90 men in St. Albans formed posses, and they chased them into Canada and arrested them. <laughs> mm-hmm. So it's quite a story. Um, and that's what that book is, Lawrence, is that it's <laughs> I guess they didn't have policemen in those days, so they had to do it themselves. Well, well they were really angry, Arlene. <laughs> they no, they really had angry. constables and police, but police, uh, talking about police, because, you know, some of this prejudice extends to police, yeah. ruta- police brutality. Yeah, you remember the episode of uh, Bill House and the Parrot where they prejudice against that black, uh, that black doctor? Oh, yeah. yeah, it's called Dark, yeah. Dark Sage was the name of the episode. Yeah, they, yeah. And I felt like, and the husband says, and he said, you can't deliver, don't let him deliver my baby, but he's the best doctor, so he delivered the baby anyway, otherwise she's going to die to like the wife, so he let him. Right, right. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. <laughs> now, now, I'm speaking about... It was like, oh my God, black, 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 you know, they finally, you know, it's an episode of the Blue House on the Prairie, yeah. Um, <laughs> quick, quick... Quick question. Well, all right. Speaking about media, you're talking about movies and and uh, and TV uh, programs. Uh, right. mo- uh, movies such as 
Glory with Matthew Broderick, uh, Se Selma, and others. Uh, what? The help with the maids had to work, you know, the maids, you know. Um, uh, in, in history, de dehumanizing slaves or people with disability, oh, oh hold on a minute, I, I, I think I skipped a question here, let me go back, um. So you're talking about the movies and, um. Yeah, yeah, how, how has, how has prejudice through media been viewed, um, today, uh, with, when it comes to prejudice? Um, like movies such as Selma, uh, you know, and other TV series dealing with prejudice? Well, I think that as far as the movies go, I think that, um, that it's really good that they've, they've been um, doing these movies. They're not, of course, they're not documentaries, so they're mm -hmm. not all fact. But, the, but what it does is it sheds light on these incredible, courageous people. Mm -hmm. um, and it's a way of educating the general public about history and about our country and i think it's a good thing because i think that it, it will it, i hope it makes people want to find out more like mm -hmm. uh, i'm telling uh my audiences when i do presentations is you know you need to dig for yourself so if you see a movie and you say did that really happen <laughs> yeah go on Go on Google and, and find out. Especially, especially the Harriet Tubman movie. Uh, Harriet, you know, the um, um, uh, that was a pretty good movie, actually. It was very well done. I was really fortunate um, that Catamount Arts um, in St. Johnsbury, Vermont, was running the film last January, and they asked uh, they asked me to come and do a talk about uh, the movie. You know, like a Q and A after the fact. Um, and, uh, you know, even though some of the things in the movie were not based on fact, mm -hmm. uh, what it did was it gave, it, you know, it really highlighted Harriet Tubman's life, and um, she was an amazing woman, and, um, I, you know, I think that people learn about history even if they don't like history mm -hmm. when you go to a movie. And the other question, part of the question, Lawrence, was about the media viewing prejudice today. I think that um, in recent years, our media um, has really covered the, like, the Me Too movement and racial injustice and police brutality. I think that they have given it, um, a, you know, a really good um, treatment so that people are aware um, because you can live here in Vermont and feel like, oh, everything's all nice and wonderful all around the country, and it's not. Mm -hmm. And I think that the media really shows you, um, shows you that this, that you know, there's this very negative um, undercurrent that we have to be aware of. We just can't be naive. That's mm -hmm. all. That's true. Yeah. Um, so um, in 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 history. Dehumanizing slaves or people with disabilities, huh? getting to people with disabilities here, or in eliminating an ethnic group, uh, culture, re culture, and or religion. What are the reasons that has been done? Well, um, I've researched um, a lot of different histories, um, you know, civilizations, uh, e Egyptian. Um, uh, you know, Scottish history, and, you you know, I think that if you took a chapter out of any country's history, you're going to find inhumane treatment of people who were different. Um, Especially, the, example, I'm, I'm bringing this up, during, uh, and it was in the Bible, during, uh, I've seen the Ten Commandments many times, uh, during Moses' time, he, he saw... Uh, the Jews being dehumanized and with the pyramids, you know, building the pyramids and, and like uh, they get they're getting tired, that they're not being fed, uh, they're not drinking, you know, drinking water, um, they're being whipped. Um, so yeah, I think all, I, yeah. I think all religions have had some form of prejudice. Yes, no. Yes, I, I agree, and, and also I've studied I studied the Bible, so I know that uh, the, the the Jewish people have been persecuted throughout their entire existence, 
like you're saying, when yes. they were in Egypt. Or, and, and, and I think that um, the, whole, the whole point of, like, the Romans conquering or, you know, uh, or the Greek Empire or any, any of these is that basically it's just the desire to dominate. Mm-hmm. So you, you take away, if you take over a country, you take away their culture so that they're subservient to you. And I think it's just a human nature thing. Um, it's just a matter of power. Mm-hmm. Now, now, during this, uh, are we allowed to mention the other, we can't mention your other book that you're writing, right? Oh, well, um, yeah, I can, I can, can briefly, you? briefly, yeah, uh, mm-hmm. um, I've been asked, I've been asked to, um, to write a book on, um, Vermont's, Vermont and, uh, people with disabilities, um, how they have been treated through the last 200 years, mm-hmm. uh, from, um, either intellectual or physical or developmental disabilities um, from the poor houses that these people were sent to uh, to the state institution Brandon Training School um, that I, I've written um, a manuscript about Vermont's history about it and um, right now uh, um, it's in the you know it's in the editing stage um, I'm hoping that it'll come out um, this coming year, 2021. Mm-hmm. Um, but it, it basically is, it was a, a very big learning experience for me because it showed how Vermont was the same as the rest of the country where people with disabilities, like you've been saying, mm-hmm. were, you know, dehumanized and were treated like animals. Well, a lot of that had to do with um, science and and uh, the medical world saying that they were. And mm-hmm. so it took a long, it's all a matter of evolution. It, it, it took a long time for people to understand what disabilities are and people with disabilities, how to help them versus uh, segregate them. And so the book focuses on this history. And it, it's very similar to, you know, it, you know, a lot of things tied in with the history that I have done with slavery um, it, it kind of all work is wo- interwoven. So yeah, that, that's and fine. we kind of yeah. we kind of answered one of the questions that you put down here. Can you can you tell, uh, tie that to history of people with disabilities? And you talking about yeah. it now? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Mm-hmm. And, and a lot of correlations and the profiling. Um, uh, I learned I learned how in our country um, during the nineteen twenties. 1930s, 40s, uh, the eugenics movement and the sterilization projects, they were basically profiling certain races they wanted to get rid of. So it all falls into place with what, you know, what, uh, you know, we've been talking about, uh, Lawrence and Arlene, we've been talking about this. So the, the book, you know, I don't have a title for the book and we don't have a book cover yet, but, uh, thanks for bringing that up. And yes, it's in the works and, uh, hopefully, um, We'll be seeing it published soon. Mm-hmm. Uh, can you tell us some examples um, of prejudice or intolerant uh, intolerance in the 1800s in Vermont? Uh, yeah, that's what um, when I was originally researching uh, Vermont. It, um, I don't know if uh, your audience knows Vermont was the first state in the in in the union to abolish slavery. So from the very from the very beginning in the late 1700s, Vermont was known as the anti-slavery state. Mm -hmm. So you could get that idea that, oh, this was a safe haven if you were, you know, my subject is about, um, you know, slavery and slaves. So if you want to come to Vermont, come on, you're welcome. But what I found when I started digging were stories of, uh, free blacks who moved to Vermont and, and were, pre- were persecuted. Um, good examples are uh, Lucy and Abijah Prince were a black couple um, who moved to Vermont and uh, they had a family, they owned property, and they were constantly persecuted by their neighbors. Um, their property would be damaged, they would be attacked, their children would be assaulted, um, the they, you know, neighbors would steal their, their horses and their cows, 
and they were the neighbors were trying to get rid of them. Why? Because they were black, mm. and they even you know, and they tried. They went to took, tried to take their white neighbors to court. Finally, uh, Lucy uh, Prince, she actually went to the Vermont governor and stated her case. She was actually a poet, uh, one of the first, I think she might have been one of the first African-American female poets in our country. Mm -hmm. And she actually convinced the governor that what what these white neighbors were doing was wrong. And so he ruled against the the white neighbors. Um, But that it didn't stop. So that was, you know. It was all because of their race. Um, you know, I found instances like that where um, if you, you know, if you had a black family living in your town, um, they were not welcomed and they were persecuted. Mm-hmm. And only because, um, I mean, I have another example. You want another example? Um, yes, please. <laughs> okay. Um, we got, uh, we got, we got nine minutes left, but go ahead. Okay. So Jeffrey Brace, um, he, he actually was kidnapped from West Africa um, as a teenager and brought here and was a slave. Um, he, he fought in the Revolutionary War and then after, and then he was given freedom because of his service in the military. And at 42 years old, he moved to Vermont because he heard it was a great place and for for free for freedom for living. Mm-hmm. And married he married a a, a, a former slave Susanna and they had a family but he lived in three different towns in uh, Manchester, Pulteney um, Sheldon, Vermont and all of them mm-hmm. um, he, he would work and they wouldn't pay him oh uh, yeah yeah mm-hmm. right um, or the like in Manchester, Vermont the selectmen um, said that they were going to take their children away from them and put them into servant servitude because they wanted to just because they were black so no matter what they did you know they they were being persecuted so that kind of treatment really didn't show me that vermont was this wonderful loving state um uh it really just showed that there was always an active presence of racism Mm -hmm. at the 1700s and the 1800s um so that's why that's that's where things kind of have um, paralleled with today. Mm-hmm. That, that's just a few examples for you, Lawrence. Um, Arlene, did you want to ask a, another question before before we kind of end? Because <laughs> take it, take your time. Even though slavery ended, how can they treat them badly like in those days? Well, because it was a political thing to end slavery. Mm-hmm. End of the Civil War, 1865. Um, yeah, Abe Lincoln ended it here with the Gettysburg Address, yeah. That, um, and, right, and so, uh, but that didn't mean that that changed everybody's mind. When the Civil War ended, the Southerners didn't say, oh, okay, you guys were right, uh, the blacks should, you know, they should be free and equal to us. Yeah. It, it, they, it didn't end. And that's the problem we have today is that you still have people who don't don't believe that somebody different, someone of a different race. Yeah, yeah. Right? So, uh, uh, it, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's, it's unfortunate and it's very ignorant. And uh, yeah. my, what I try to do is um, my books are, are an offshoot of the lectures and presentations that I do in schools and, um, you know, to, for adults at festivals and, right. and what I try to do is just to let people know that, you know, um, we have to be aware of this prejudice, um, and that it, it's not new. This is from the beginning of time mm-hmm. and, and we can learn a lot from history. So that's the big thing is, and we hope prejudice I mean, prejudice might not necessarily go away, but I think if people work together, uh, you know, because, you know, it, it, power in numbers, I think if people work together, um, mm-hmm. we can, era- you know, maybe eradicate it slowly. Well, and I think that's a good point, Lawrence, and I think that uh, in the last four years, seeing 
seeing the Black Lives Matter movement, I mean, that's really encouraging because I really believe that it's, it, you know, people are standing up and saying, hey, you know, this isn't right. It's not fair. Mm-hmm. And I think it's important to do that. And, you know, um, just like in this, you know, the 60s with the movement. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I really think that it's important for people to stand up and say, you know, it's not okay to be treated this way anymore. And so with people with disabilities, with my new book out, coming out, um, it took parents and it took, um, it took people standing up to say, hey, you know, we're people too. And that's, that's the biggest message is that everybody deserves the pursuit of happiness and a, a good life. Mm-hmm. Um, and it doesn't matter if you have disabilities, if you're black, if you're Jewish, if you're, you know, um, right. whatever, you know. And, um, we, we, we need to be treated equally. And, and with that said, uh, we would like to thank, uh, uh, so let's show your books one last time. Um, thank you. We would like to thank Michelle Arnosky Sherburn, uh, the <laughs> author of, I think, am I saying that right, Anoski? You got it. You got okay. it right. Uh, um, <laughs> uh, Michelle Anoski Sherburn, the author of um, Abolition and the Underground Railroad in Vermont. Let me show that one more time. Um, and it's done by the History Press, and you can find yep. that on Amazon.com. Uh, um, um, and, you know, we're not allowed to give prices, but I'm sure people can buy your book. Oh, yeah, they can buy it all online or in bookstores. All yeah, yeah, the probably um, some other bookstores have your book. That's one. Okay. And then the other book here that I have is Slavery in the Underground Railroad in New Hampshire, also done by History Press uh, by um, uh, Michelle Anoski sherburn And... Um, Arlene, what's, you have the other book in front of you. What's the other book name? The St. Albans Raid. By uh, Michelle Anoski Sherburn, also done by History Press. You can get it. Uh, you can get it at www.amazon.com and other bookstores. Well, we would like to thank uh, Michelle Anoski uh, Sherburn for joining us today on Able Then On Air. Again, uh, we would like to also thank our sponsors, Washington County Mental Health, Green Mountain Support Services, and many, many others. Um, This will air in January. Um, And um, thank you again, Michelle, for joining us on this edition of Ableton on Air. Uh, I'm Lauren Seiler. I'm Lauren Seiler. See you next time. Major sponsors for Ableton On Air include Green Mountain Support Services of Vermont, Washington County Mental Health, Ale Israel. Food sponsors for Ableton On Air include Geffen Foods Israel, Osem Foods Israel. Major media sponsors for Ableton On Air include Parkchester Times, Muslim Community Report, www.thisisthebronx.info, Associated Press Media Editors, U.S. Press Corps, Domestic and International, Anchor FM, and Spotify.